am so delighted to introduce our speaker because she is my former student and I never visualized the day that she would be here talking about being a therapist because she was a broadcast major with a PR emphasis. And her name is Mary Beth Duty. And I'm gonna just quickly tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Mary Beth is originally from Tupelo. She graduated in 2004 with, of course, that broadcast journalism degree. Then she went to SMU and got her master's in counseling she trained in something I hope she'll explain, psychodrama. Y'all know what that is? Me either, we'll find out, okay. And she is certified in heart-centered hypnotherapy. Isn't that cool? And she has also created a mindfulness training curriculum for children, and she teaches meditation to adults and children. Are you gonna do that this morning? Um. I could at the end. That would maybe. be really cool if we could meditate for two, two minutes. Yeah, okay. She is now the owner of her own counseling center, and she is leaving some business cards here because Lord knows every one of us needs some counseling sometimes, especially me this week, y'all. It's <laughs> been quite the week. And she's also worked in community mental health, drug court, outpatient program, inpatient chemical dependency, and partial hospitalization program, as well as private practice. And on top of all that, she's a very cool lady. So y'all welcome Mary Beth Duty. Thank you. Thank you. All you. Now. All right. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So, um, so like Miss Street said, I'm. Um, if you had told me when I was sitting where y'all are that I would be a therapist up here talking one day, I would have told you that you were full of it um, because I did not ever see that coming. Um, so just a tiny bit about how I did arrive to what I do now is that I was, um, um, again, broadcast journalism, and then I went into sales. I went to advertising sales, which led me to pharmaceutical sales, selling neuroscience drugs, so I sold the psych drugs that um, I'm now on the flip side of. Um, and I just saw that so many people, um, the doctors were talking to patients about, um, you know, let's change this medication, let's add this medication. Oh, this isn't working, let's switch you to this. But there was not much of a, hey, let's look at the root of this. Let's see where this is coming from instead of adding 1,560 million pills um, that might not be needed. Yes, it's needed for some people, and I get that, but I, I, it's my personal opinion that um, we are way over-medicated um, in terms of anything neuroscience-related. So um, I was not going to do a PowerPoint. Um, the main reason is that's just not well with my soul. <laughs> it just does not work for me. Um, because then I would just be up here like I would get so lost in that that I wouldn't, it just wouldn't be authentic for me because I just talk and what comes to me I kind of say. Um, so um, what I do want to kind of hit on um, is I'm curious about all of you. How many people do you all know um, who go to therapy or have gone to therapy? Anybody willing to shout out numbers? Saw two of you. What was that somebody said? More than you can count. Good. Because that's actually rare when I ask that question, usually. Um, might be because y'all are younger and it's being more acceptable now. Um, but typically when I ask that question, um, people, my clients, um, say either nobody or one or two people or a few acquaintances, um, but not really that many people. Um, any idea why that might be? No. So, again, it's just my opinion. The reason for that is um, there's so much stigma about being the person that goes to counseling. Um, and then also because it is so hard. It is hard as hell to go to therapy and truly do your work. Um, I can have somebody sit in front of me, a client can come week after week after week after week and not do any work. That's when I nicely say, hey, I don't think I'm the therapist for you. Let me find somebody that can help you. Because if you're not willing, there's nothing I can do. You could have the best therapist in the entire world. And 
it's not going to do any good if you're not ready to do your work. Um, what I tell people is that, yes, it is going to be absolutely one of the most difficult things probably that you've ever done if you truly do your work. Um, but it's worth it. Um, and myself, I mean, this is my opinion again. I have lots of those. Um, but I think a good therapist cannot, I don't think you can be a good therapist unless you have done your work, unless you have gone to counseling, you have worked through so many things. Um, because imagine if somebody came in and sat in front of me, um, and I'll be speaking, I'll be on the panel later, so y'all hear, will hear more about this. Um, but I grew up, my father was an alcoholic. Um, and think if I had never worked on what all of that meant for me about what I grew up with. And I had a client come in who was a male around my dad's age and started telling me about all of his drinking. I would not be able to be compassionate with this man and listen to what's gotten him to that point. If I hadn't worked on myself, I would immediately be thinking, you know what, he needs to get it together. Look what he's doing to his family. What's wrong with him? So if any of you are looking for a therapist, I tell people that you have every right to ask your therapist if he or she has ever been to therapy. If they say no or refuse to answer, just my opinion, again, I'd get up and leave. They don't have to tell you and shouldn't tell you what their issues are and what things that they've been through. But if they can't look at you and say, yes, I've sat in that chair too. Yes, I've worked on my stuff. I wouldn't want them near me <laughs> because they, they could do a number of different things, um, transference, all that stuff. I'm not going to get into all that. But um, So those are just my thoughts kind of on um, why people go, why people don't go to counseling. Um, and one of the other things, too, I think, is that we, I'm sorry if y'all are trying to film me, I move around a lot, um, is we so easily will go to the doctor for a headache, for um, a sinus infection, for allergies. Um, we want a prescription. Um, but we don't look at, even with those things that just seem like a medical or a physical issue, we don't look at what might be there emotionally attached to that also. It's my belief that almost every physical ailment is the result of emotional stuff that's not been dealt with. Um, think about, um, I'll, I see little kids, I love the little ones, and I see adults. Um, I see from four up until 99. Um, but so when I work with kids, one of the things that I work with so, mo uh, so much and the reason that I do the mindfulness training and things like that is um, they'll, they'll tell me, the parents will tell me that they had to pick their kid up from school, you know, three times in the last month because the kid had a tummy ache. How many of you, when you were sick, that's what you knew to say? I have a tummy ache. My tummy hurts. Mm, probably not. Um, but what we learn is when we have all these emotions and things that are inside of us, we don't know what to do um, because we've not been taught that, hey, that might be that I'm upset about something um, or I'm scared or somebody made me mad. Um, and so it's easier to make that something physical, to be able to say, oh, my stomach hurts. Um, and also, you get attention that way. My stomach hurts. Oh, my goodness. Do you need to go to the doctor? Okay, let's go to the doctor and see if we can get you some medicine. And think about, I know myself, like all the times when I said I was sick when I was little. I knew I wasn't. If I'd really looked at it, um, things would be a lot different. I'm glad I took the path I did, but um, it taught me a lot. Um, but I just think that it's so easy to name something as physical than it is to look at what the issue is that probably caused the physical stuff. Um, so if we, let's just take um, chronic pain. That's one of the things I see a lot of in my practice. 
Um, and a lot of that then leads to what I'm sure y'all are all familiar with, the um, substance abuse stuff. Um, I see a lot of that too. Um, but I'll have people that come in all the time and um, they, my, floor, my office is on the second floor. Woo, those stairs are steep. But, you know, they complain. They're like, oh, I don't know if I can come up these stairs. My knees hurt so bad. My back hurts so bad. I'm just so bad off and all of that. And I start noticing throughout their sessions and when I do um, some really in-depth stuff, um, like the heart-centered hypnotherapy that Ms. Street mentioned, um, which is incredibly healing, deep, deep work. Um, they start telling me that they're not taking their medicine for chronic pain anymore, that they don't need it. Um, and to me, that just confirms, like I'm saying, um, it was emotional but again, to begin with that manifested into physical. Um, now, I'm not a research person. I don't like it. It's boring to me. I won't read it, but you can read it and tell me what, I, what it says. Um, I'm good with that, but I'm not going to read it because it's boring to me. So sorry for any of you that like research. Um, I have plenty of projects y'all can do some research for me on if you want. Um, but um, I, th I think it would be interesting to look at um, what can be done to remove kind of those physical presentations um, when people come in and tell me that that's what's going on. Um, and I just think, Think about how many times when we say, you know, I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders, then that turns into back pain, neck pain. Um, then you're going to the chiropractor, you're going to get massages, you're going to do all of these things to treat that. And then again, like I said, you're not pe peeling back the root of where that came from. Um, any questions about that? I don't know what I'm talking about. Any thoughts? And I'm totally okay if any of you disagree. Um, so, some of the main things, um, I mentioned um, substance abuse, but anxiety and depression are the two biggest things um, that I see. And I think that if you look at kind of all men mental illness together, I think you could narrow down the majority of things to anxiety and depression. Um, you know, I dealt with depression for years and years and years and years um, and wasn't even sure that's what it was. Um, didn't want it to be because then I was that person um, that should just get over it, um, that should just pull myself up and be happy because I've got all these things to be thankful for. Um, but then also anxiety. Um, more and more and more I'm seeing anxiety is becoming larger um, than depression is. Um, and I think also they can go hand in hand. Um, so I'll give you an example. This is, um, I'd probably say 60 to 70% of my clients, um, adult clients, where they come in and they've got depression and anxiety going on. Um, they get into these funks where they can't um, do anything for days. Um, or they're just barely functioning, going to work, coming home, putting on the PJs, getting in the bed, staying in the bed, and, you know, waking up and doing it again, barely functioning. And they have all these things that they need to do or that they want to do, and the list gets longer and longer and longer, but they don't have the motivation because the depression is so heavy to be able to do that. So then a few days into that, they... Um, start getting overwhelmed because that list of one to two to three things that they needed to get done hasn't been done. And so then it flips them into extremely high anxiety, um, which comes with that kind of self, self-loathing self talk of, my God, you wasted three days. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you get out of the bed? You knew better than this. You're so lazy. Get up. Now you don't have time to do all of this. And what are you going to do? How are you going to get it all done? This is to you. This is to you. I've got to go here. I've got to go there. Why don't I do this? And so you get so overwhelmed that you do nothing because you can't see where to even start. Um, and so then that puts people right back into the depression. Um, so it's just, it's, 
it's just this cycle. Um, there's one thing, the heart-centered hypnotherapy that I mentioned that I do, um, I train with that through the Wellness Institute um, in Seattle. Um, and one of the things that, that I've learned from them, it's called the Victim Triangle. Um, so it is, it, at the top is the rescuer, if y'all can see my triangle I'm making with my hands, rescuer, victim, excuse me, victim, rescuer, persecutor. So everybody in the entire world, myself included, has participated in the victim triangle. Um, it's never healthy. It it's, um, fosters so much codependency. Um, but I'm going to give you an example of depression and anxiety and what that looks like in that triangle. Um, other people can participate in this triangle with you. Um, but I think the thing that I see the most is, like I was saying, kind of that self-talk um, and putting yourself through all the roles. So I'll give you an example. Um, it starts probably in the victim role where you think about all the things in your life that are not good. Um, and, you know, I was supposed to do this. I didn't do that. Um, nobody wants me to be around. Whatever those negative things are that you tell yourself. Um, and it's that victim mentality. And I've learned the, the word victim is highly offensive to a lot of people. Um, and I get that side of it too, because people want to have this vision of themselves. That I'm not a victim, I'm strong, I'm a survivor, all of that. Um, so if you need to replace that with a different word, that's fine. Um, but that mentality of poor me, why me, what's wrong with me, I can't do anything, throws you down into the rescuer role to where you need somebody or something to rescue you. Um, that can be where substance abuse comes in, um, drinking, drugs, all that to escape, all the stuff that was going on in the victim um, role. Or it can be sleep, or it can be staying busy. Um, it can be, um, you know, going and helping somebody else. And by helping, I don't mean truly helping. I mean doing something for somebody else that they can do so that you feel good. Um, and then when you do that, the next role is the persecutor role. So if somebody rescued you and pulled you out of that victim role, then you're going to persecute them and be mad at them. Um, and, you know, why didn't you just let me do this, blah, 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 all those things. Or you persecute yourself, which is really the hardest um, and the one that we keep silent about the most. Um, and it's, again, to that kind of negative self-talk of, um, you know, you knew you shouldn't have drank like that. Or um, you knew you shouldn't have stayed in bed. Now that you stayed in bed and you didn't, you know, um, do anything to make yourself feel better, um, you deserve to be worthless. You, you know... Everything that you told yourself is true. You're worthless. Um, you know, you just have nothing to offer anybody. Just all those things. Well, guess what? That puts you right back into victim. And so it goes. Um, so it's just, it's like I said, anxiety and depression within the victim triangle is one of those things that it is incredibly difficult to step out of. Um, I tell people when they... When, when I work with them on that triangle, that um, to me, for myself, because I was so heavy in that good Lord um, with my family, with myself, with friends, relationships, um, I had to just first kind of recognize um, when I was stepping into a role um, or when I noticed that somebody else was. Um, and um, I don't know if any of you are young enough to remember, but the... Flintstones used to have, Fred Flintstone would have a good little angel and a little devil on his shoulder, conscious. Um, and to me, I'm kind of a visual person, so I would imagine that little um, devil or whatever telling me, whoo, victim, 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 here you go, here you go. How's that feel? Stop that. <laughs> um, to just be able to recognize there, I was about to step right back into it. Or if, you know, say that um, somebody else in my life, I noticed that they were in um, the victim role. Because one of the roles I played in the majority of my life, and in a lot of ways was probably born into, 
um, in my family is that I would want to jump in and rescue them. Let me give them that money. Let me, you know, um, go do this for them. Let me take them out to eat or something, get them out of the house. And when I would notice somebody in the victim role, I had to talk to myself about, uh-uh, no ma'am, no ma'am. They've got to do that themselves. Um, because then what would happen for me is I would get so mad that I always had to rescue somebody. I always did everything for them. And then I would get mad at myself for doing it and then mad at them. And, hi, I'm persecutor now. So then victim. Um, so it's just one of those things that is so hard <laughs> to step out of. So, so, so hard. Um, but it is possible. Um, so Miss Street had mentioned um, psychodrama, if any of you want to know. Um, a little bit about that. Um, I do, we were just speaking just a little bit ago, I do what's called experiential therapy. Um, it's hard to explain it. So it's, um, in so many ways, I'm not a very traditional therapist. Um, I don't do a whole lot of just talk therapy where you just sit and talk to me. Um, for multiple reasons. Number one, that didn't work for me that much. It did in some ways, but it, it was not a, what allowed me when I was in therapy to truly look at the things that were going on with me. So um, experiential allows different kinds of props, gets you to actually experience things going on, um, and to be able to kind of put your hands on something. Um, and there's so many other different types of experiential, but to give you an example, um, like if you walk into my office, um, there's stuff all around and, um, colored water bottles, uh, stacks of, you know, laminated pictures of bridges, doors, all kinds of different things. Um, and one of the things I use the most often um, is paint chips from Lowe's, Home Depot. Um, I go and get, they probably think I have a mansion with the craziest colors painted ever. Um, but I found those are one of the most amazing tools um, that I've created for me to be able to use. When somebody comes in and, you know, they're having difficulty, you know, it's hard to sit in that seat for those of you who have been in therapy. It's hard to sit there and think, this lady doesn't know me. Um, oh, my God, what's she going to think about me when I tell her A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Um, and so I know how that feels, and it's, it's hard. Um, so a lot of times I'm in the floor probably 80% of the time. Um, my clients, when they first walk in or get to know me, they're like, that lady is crazy. Um, I'm usually barefoot. Um, yeah, it's just part of my personality, but I just throw the chips, like the paint chips, out on the floor. And um, I tell them, I want you to choose four or five colors that represent what's going on with you right now. Um, I've yet to have anybody ever look at me like I was crazy and not do it. Um, they immediately get in the floor and start, and you can see their whole train of thought go and they start grabbing this color and this color and this color and then they're sitting back and thinking and usually on the last one they're thinking this is going to be the hard one do I choose this color and tell her what it is or not um, but that's that's just a style that works for me and in my personality um, but then it opens them up to be able to say you know well the reason I picked this color is because it reminds me of um, you know, whatever is going on in their life. I'm trying to think of a recent example. Um, so, um, one girl told me, this reminds me, um, she picked this one color, it was like orange. So this reminds me of my parents fighting all the time. Um, and when I would go in the closet, um, and there was this big old huge orange blanket and I would just wrap myself in that blanket. Um, so think about just that one little piece there. Um, for any of you that know much about therapy or been much, typically that much information would take five to six sessions and maybe even more to get out of somebody. 
Um, but it's easier to put something in your hand to look at that and say, this reminds me of this, or this looks like when. Um, and when you're able to kind of have that connection up front to take the pressure off of, she's sitting there staring at me, she's probably analyzing me, she's probably thinking this, and da 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 da, da. you get lost in that, and you can't focus as much on what you're there for. Um, the things I do, um, it's always funny when an adult comes in because, like I said, when you come and look in my office um, and you're used to traditional therapists or haven't ever been to a therapist and what you've seen on TV of a therapist, which always makes me giggle, <laughs> um, my office isn't what you would expect. And so they tell me, oh, you work with children, don't you? That, mu that must be what you use all that stuff for. <laughs> nope, we're going to use it on you. <laughs> um, but it's, I think that's one of the interesting things about what I do is that it works from four years old all the way up, um, different ages. Um, so back to psychodrama, that's kind of experiential stuff. So psychodrama is, um, it can be done individually. A lot of times it's done in groups, um, where you, um, and I'm going to Chicago this summer. I'm learning, doing some more training um, to do energetic psychodrama, which is psychodrama under hypnosis. Um, so plain psychodrama is where usually you have a group of people, um, and one person is what's called the protagonist, and they kind of recreate a situation that's been tough for them, or they create a situation that they want to have and different people play those roles. So any of you people interested in drama um, would love this. Um, but it's, I mean, one of the things could be that, you know, somebody up here could um, sit in the chair and tell me, you know, I've lost my connection spiritually. Um, so they might decide, I want to talk to my mom about that because my mom, you know, always told me I had to be this, this, and this, and I had to go to church you know, every day and do this and that, and that's not working for me. And so they might have a conversation with mom. So they would choose somebody to play mom. But when they choose that person to play mom, they actually themselves have to step into the role of being mom in order to show the person how mom would react. And when you do that, it gives you such a different perspective because you step into that, like, oh, well, my mom would probably, she was probably thinking how she just wants the best for me and that that's what's worked for her and all of that. Um, and it really makes people think, okay, maybe my mom wasn't this judgmental in your face. This is what you have to do, all of that. But that's just how I experienced it. Um, so that's a very small piece of what psychodrama is. Um, yeah, and I trained um, in... Um, psychodrama um, when I was in Dallas. Um, I went to Southern Methodist University, SMU, in um, Dallas, and they have the largest institute um, in the country there. Um, and it's just fascinating stuff. Not many people do it. Um, but a lot of the things that I do, like I was talking about the paint chips, different pictures of bridges and things like that, um, are stuff that I created. Um, that is one of my strong... Um, Characteristics is that I'm very creative, um, and I would have never imagined that um, being a therapist would allow me to use creativity like I do. Um, but with psychodrama, the experiential stuff, um, all of that, I feel like I'm able to offer something that's a little bit deeper, um, a little bit easier to do um, because when you're a therapist and somebody's sitting in front of you, um, in so many ways your life is in their hands um, and they're coming to you to help start that healing process. Um, and to kind of go back a tiny bit, 
like I was saying when I started about myself having to go to therapy uh, to become a therapist. Um, again, I would have never thought that I would be a therapist ever, 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 ever. And a lot of people who knew me years back would laugh at you <laughs> if they told you, if you, if they heard that I was a therapist. Um, but I was um, kind of forced to go to therapy myself. I don't, not forced by somebody forced me, but circumstances forced me. So I was hit by a drunk driver um, and um, wasn't able to work for quite a few years because of all the surgeries and all of that. Um, and so in that, I was not just physically a mess but mentally so much worse. Not from that, but because of the things that um, I had never dealt with as a kid. Um, and so me doing my work in that um, and going to therapy and seeing that it was possible to be okay with who I was um, is what led me to that. So um, that to me is kind of going back to the stigma of mental illness about why it took me until I was 28 years old um, to go to therapy. Um, because I think even, I'm from Tupelo, um, and I think even nowadays that there's still um, a lot of stigma about going to therapy. Um, that there's something wrong with you. Um, there is, uh, you know, something that can't be fixed. Oh, the crazy person has to go to therapy. Um, and even when I was looking for my office location, I remember people telling me, you want it to be in a place where nobody can really see it so nobody gets seen going in there. And I thought, ugh, that's just yucky to me. Um, because it's not the people who go to therapy that scare me. It's the people who don't. <laughs> um, because everybody at some point in their life can benefit from therapy. Um, nobody's life is perfect. I mean, mine is far from perfect, and I still go to therapy when things come up, and I always will. Um, that's part of being a therapist is that I'm going to have to um, in order to be okay for the people in front of my clients. Um, but I think the stigma is getting a lot better. Um, we still have a long ways to go. Um, and I think a lot of where that comes from is, and is ironic considering that uh, <laughs> I used to have a job selling these medications. Um, uh, I worked for Eli Lilly, if any of y'all are familiar, one of the largest big pharmas out there. Um, I sold Zyprexa, Cymbalta, Symbiax, Stratera, I'm sure some of y'all have heard of those. But I think now it's almost where, like, that's the okay thing to do. Like, it's okay to talk about, I'm on an antidepressant. Oh, I had to take this medication, oh, just because I have a chemical imbalance. Um, and actually, science is looking at that, and that's not actually completely accurate anymore. Um, so I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, but so I think we're getting closer because now people can talk about, oh, well, I take an antidepressant or, you know, whatever medication I, I take um, for that. People talk about it. But I still don't think we're at a point to be able to say um, completely in front of, you know, not worrying about who hears it. Hey, I go to therapy. Um, I'm in therapy. Um, does that seem on par with what y'all have seen? Kind of, it's easier to be able to say, yeah, oh, I got to get, get my prescription for my depression, or I got to go get a prescription for my anxiety. Uh, well, let's look at what's underneath that. Something got you to that point to need a medication. Um, so it is not my area of expertise, but I'm going to say a tiny, tiny, tiny piece, research all you want on it. But they are now looking at um, doctors and pharmaceutical companies are now looking at um, the neurotransmitters in the brain that people thought is what caused depression and anxiety and 
all these mental illnesses, the chemical imbalance. Um, only about maybe 15 to 20 percent of those neurotransmitters are actually in the brain. But yet billions and billions and billions of dollars are being spent and um, people are taking all these medications to um, balance the neurotransmitters in their brain when they're actually figuring out that about 80 percent of the neuro neurotransmitters, um, serotonin, do uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, are actually in the gut, not the brain. So um, my kind of counseling approach is, is more one of like a holistic approach, like I was saying, um, to look at the whole body. How are you treating your body? What are you doing to get some kind of moderate exercise? What are you eating? Um, and I think people are now starting to look at the more holistic approach of let me look at the entire body of what's going on. Um, you're tired all the time. One of the biggest things with depression, fatigue, um, no energy. Well, when you go into the doctor, what are they going to do for that? Blood work. And you know what? Let's try this medication a few weeks later. That's not working. I'm still just so exhausted. Well, let's add this or change this. Um, so I hope that people will start getting to a point where, and people, I guess maybe doctors and providers and, and just, yeah, people too, just people in general, um, will look at the mental health side of that too because that is such a huge, huge, huge part of the whole body and, and the health. Um, because if you have your physical health, your physical health is, is good or decent, but you're not there mentally, it's just my belief you're not going to have that physical health much longer. If you hang on to the mental stuff, it's going to show up in physical signs, um, heart attacks, high blood pressure, all these other things that just kind of grow, um, so I am going to leave a few minutes to do a meditation, if y'all are open to that. If anybody has a quick question before we do that. No? No questions. So um, I don't know what y'all's experience is with meditations. Um, what I will tell you is that you don't have to sit in a perfect position with your hands on your knees like that. Um, but what I do say is um, sit where your spine is aligned so that... Um, energy can travel through the spine. Um, if you are um, good at kind of grounding yourself, I always sit with my knees, my legs crossed like a little child. Um, but if you're going to sit and have your feet on the floor, have your legs not crossed and have both feet on the ground so that you're grounded equal weight in both feet. Um, so when we do this, um, just know that there's no wrong way to do it. I think a lot of people um, shy away from meditation because they say, I can't do that, I tried. And I couldn't stop thinking about this and that and that and this. Um, well, guess what, that's normal. Uh, I went to an event um, about a year ago where some Buddhist monks and nuns came and did a day of mindfulness. And I remember one of the Buddhist monks saying, um, I have thoughts pop into my head um, during meditation. And I remember thinking, whoa. <laughs> It's your like, job, your life, is to meditate, and that happens to you? Um, so I say that to say if you do have a thought or many thoughts that pop into your head, um, don't go down the path of, oh, my gosh, now I can't concentrate. I'm not even listening to what she's saying and all that. Just be like, hey, thought, and just let it go. And if you have to, if they just keep coming, return to the words within yourself just to say, like, breathing in. And breathing out um, you know if that's what you need tune me out and just say to yourself breathing in and breathing out um, and that will start slowing your mind um, any questions before we start no okay um, so just whenever y'all are ready just kind of softly close your eyes and let your body just kind of relax um, just knowing that right now, there's nowhere you have to be. 
nothing that you have to do other than just have this time here for yourself. Just slowing your breath to just a natural pace of breathing in and breathing out. Feeling like just a wave of relaxation starting from your head. Just moving from your head down through your neck, shoulders, through your core, and down your legs, right into the ground. And I want you to imagine a relaxing place out in nature, whatever that place is to you. Let yourself just fully be there. Hearing the sounds of your relaxing place out in nature. Maybe the wind, the birds. Let yourself notice the smells around you. The clean air. The colors all around you. Just letting yourself feel all the familiar feelings around you. Letting yourself fully be there. Now let yourself look for a path out in your place in nature. And start walk, walking towards the path. Noticing how easy it is to just wander down the path. Noticing all of the beautiful things just for you here. And as you continue to walk down the path, notice that there's a tree stump with a box or some type of gift sitting on it. And the closer you get to that, the more you realize it's exactly what you needed. Whatever is in that is a gift that you needed. Might be a word, might be a symbol, might be something tangible. Whenever you're ready, allow yourself to open that box or see the gift that's there for you. Notice the feelings that come up. To know that you've received what you've needed. In some way, show gratitude. If it's just a prayer, if it's just a nod, if it's just simply saying thank you for what you've received. And now put your hand on your heart. To really let yourself feel what it feels like to be relaxed, full of self-love, and being able to get what you need. So that any time you need to come back to this place, all you'll have to do is close your eyes, take deep breaths, put your hand on your heart, and you'll come right back to this calm, relaxing place. And you can release your hand now. And in a minute, I'll count from one up until three. And when I get to three, we'll be back in the room feeling relaxed, yet full of energy. So one, feeling the energy flooding back through your feet, up through your body. Two, more and more energy all throughout your body. Three, eyes softly open, wide awake, calm and relaxed. Five, 
So that's a very simple, short meditation. Um, and when you put your hand on your heart, just to kind of give you a little piece to take away, what that did was um, set an anchor in your brain, kind of like a new little neural pathway, so that when you need to take a time out and go back to that, that like I said, all you'll have to do is close your eyes, um, and your body has kind of memorized now that closing your eyes, taking a deep breath, putting your hand on your heart to kind of take you right back there. So um, that is it. I really appreciate because we need to wrap up for the door prizes, I think. But thank you all for coming and letting me talk.